Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, tens of thousands of Jewish and Arab women rally, calling on their Israeli and Palestinian leaders to resume peace talks. As the cycle of violence and bloodshed continues in Yemen, Saudis battle a border spillover. Also on this week's programme, award-winning French-Iranian journalist Delphine Minoui offers us an insight into the journey of a group of Syrian activists in this book with a difference. They had weapons in one hand and their books in the other. She joins us in the studio. But first to Israel and Palestinian territories where women have joined forces to wage a campaign to put peace back on top of the political agenda. Over the weekend, some 30,000 of them took part in a rally in Jerusalem. Now they have to find a way of uniting their leaders so that they can return to the negotiation table. Iris Makler brings you the story. Israeli and Palestinian women want to channel female energy to bring an end to this conflict. Women Wage Peace was formed after the Gaza War of 2014 by Israeli mothers, including French migrant Pascal Shen. This is my responsibility to do something as a citizen, as a mother. And uh, after the war, I realized that uh, it's about time. Uh, I should do something. I should uh, uh, stop watching TV and crying in front of the screen. They're holding marches across the country this autumn. They're hoping to unite women to push for peace. Palestinian and Israeli, old and young, Muslim, Christian and Jewish and also left and right within Israeli society. Many people that we don't know in the street coming, joining us, singing with us, dancing with us. But for Palestinian women, it's different. They can't just join in. The only place Israelis and Palestinians can meet without permits is in a part of the West Bank known as Area C. So that's where the main Women Wage Peace Rally is taking place. Uh, the message is uh, enough with violence, enough with hatred, enough with blood, enough with war. We need to work for peace. Thousands of women walk together in the desert near the Dead Sea. Mingling freely, they say they feel that they are no longer enemies. They're heading for a tent named for Hagar and Sarah, the biblical mothers of the Muslim and Jewish peoples. I am optimistic because if we're not, it means that we get frustrated and frustration leads to dangerous uh, consequences. In the tent, Palestinian Lama Abu Akrub finally gets to meet Israeli Pascal Shen. Giving unconditionally, loving unconditionally, it's, it's women and basically mothers and women in general. So when they get together, uh, it's a huge power. Critics say this is idealistic, not realistic. But Women Wage Peace believes soft power can lead to real results to benefit both peoples. Turning our attention to Yemen, where fighting between forces loyal to the internationally recognized president, backed by a Saudi-led coalition, and Houthi rebels has left around 10,000 people dead. Today, neighboring Riyadh is finding it increasingly challenging to prevent a conflict that it backs from spilling over its borders. Catherine Viet brings you the latest. Quiet rains in the Saudi village of Al Tuwal on the shores of the Red Sea. And for good reason, it's become a ghost town. Its residents evacuated after Houthi rebels kept bombing the schools, mosques and houses. After two years of fighting, the conflict is now spilling over into Saudi Arabia as the rebels carry out cross-border raids. Yet according to the Saudi border guards, life in the region continues peacefully. There are no side effects from the war on people's lives. They're living a normal life. Thanks to God and to our full control of the border lines, side by side with the armed forces, the border guards have been able to impose full control and secure the protection of our people. 
Situated along the border with Yemen, Jizan province is another area targeted by Houthi raids. They've killed 140 people in Saudi Arabia since March 2015, a relatively small figure compared to the more than 3,000 civilians killed in Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition raids. The Houthis don't have planes to bomb Saudi Arabia, like Saudi Arabia bombs Yemen, so they carry out border raids instead. They do it to show the Saudis, who've been bombing Yemen, they won't be able to control the conflict, which is probably true, because as long as the Saudis don't put boots on the ground, there's no chance of defeating their Houthi enemy. Riyadh led an intervention in 2015 after the rebels forced out President Abdu Rabu Mansour Hadi. Despite Saudi Arabia's superior air power and 11 nations strong coalition, Houthi rebels remain firmly in control of their captured territory. Conflict has benefited al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which has used the chaos to expand its territory. After two and a half years, the kingdom appears to be in a stalemate. Saudi Arabia's continued air raids have drawn the ire of the UN, which accuses Riyadh of indiscriminately targeting civilians. The UN has added the Saudi-led coalition to a blacklist of groups responsible for children's deaths. Now, Ankara has sent troops across its border into Syria to prop up rebel groups in the northwestern Idlib enclave. The country's officials say the move is aimed at implementing a de-escalation agreement backed by Moscow and Tehran, designed to reduce fighting in the bitterly contested area. The prime minister has also added that the operation aims to prevent a wave of migration from Syria into Turkey. Over to a country embroiled in a bloody conflict for over six years, and yet another chronicle of resistance. This time we'll bring you the story of a group of young Syrian activists who built a secret library in a hidden basement in a suburb south of the capital, Damascus. Their goal? To save the books of Daraya, rescued from abandoned houses, destroyed offices and ravaged mosques. And one woman followed their journey over the years and published it in a book entitled Les Passeurs de Livre de Daraya, which translates into the book Saviors of Daraya. Delphine Minuit is an award-winning Franco-Iranian journalist for Le Figaro, and uh, she joins us here on Middle East Matters. Delphine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Mm. Uh, let's start with the photo that very much inspired you to write this book. It was a very surprising uh, picture. It was in uh, 2015, at a time when it, was, when it was really hard to get access to Damascus because the regime was uh, giving a hard time to journalists in terms of giving, providing them with visas. It was really hard as well to go to rebel-controlled areas uh, because of the kidnappings and the tensions we know. Uh, so I was surfing on the web and I just bumped into a picture on a Facebook page called Humans of Syria. And it was a very intriguing picture indeed because you could see um, two young guys going through books, surrounded by walls of books. There's no light, there's no window, there's no door. It's very intriguing. And so I, I read the caption, and the caption was referring to a secret underground library of Daraya. And I was really impressed because we all knew that at that time Daraya was besieged. So how come a group of guys are trying to survive through books when they are facing daily bombings by the regime? And of course, at the time, Daraya was very much not accessible by journalists. So you managed to establish a rapport and pretty much write this book based on correspondence that you had with them via Skype and WhatsApp. Can you talk us through that process? It, it was a very challenging process because it's, it's always hard as a reporter uh, to describe the reality on the ground when you cannot access uh, what's going on over there. So we developed a relationship, a virtual relationship through WhatsApp, Skype, thanks to the videos on Skype. Um, somehow I, I kind of started living with them just through the window of, of internet. So basically, as you can imagine, there was no electricity. Uh, they were facing uh, constant shellings. Uh, internet was cutting all the time. But in between, you know, those terrible times, we, we tried as much as possible to keep in touch. So we were speaking together early in the morning, if it was necessary, in the middle of the night, whenever they had a possibility to talk and tell us about their story. And you talk about them in the book as activists who had 
weapons in one hand and books in the other. What did these books symbolize to them? To them, first of all, uh, the idea of gathering these books under the rubble of the city, 15,000 books, can you imagine? The idea was to save their cultural heritage. But slowly, slowly, books became more powerful for them. It was a way to escape the harsh reality. It became a way as well to educate themselves because these are guys who grew up under the propaganda of the, of the regime of Bashar al-Assad. So to them, a book was, uh, the meaning of a book was the propaganda. And all of a sudden, they started opening all these books with a, a huge diversity in front of their eyes. And so it, it became this library, this little safe haven in an underground, in a basement of the city, uh, became a sanctuary, a place to learn, to exchange, and to build up an ideal future for their country. Now, of course, in the media, we really tend to focus on extremes, either the Syrian government or the jihadists. Would you say that these activists, and this is what interested you, represented a so-called uh, moderate opposition force in Syria? Oh, completely. To me, they, they represent this third voice between Damascus and Daesh. Unfortunately, these days, we only talk about Syria. Uh, through the war against terrorism. But those guys, look at them. Or the jihadis, I mean, the, the way they carry their books, the way they read, it's just an illustration of how those guys tried as much as they could uh, to, um, to bring up, to, to, to make the, the spirit of the revolution of 2011, to make it survive uh, through peaceful means. Uh, because those guys were, were, were reading a, a real diversity of books. They were reading, of course, books on theology, on philosophy, but also they were also interested in Western writers. One of their favorite books was The Alchemist of Paolo Coelho. They were really interested also into uh, self-help books, uh, personal development books like, uh, uh, like uh, books uh, by uh, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And to them, those books uh, were helping them to, to keep sort of an order in their life, to, as they, they used to say, to remain sane, healthy, to escape uh, craziness in the middle of the chaos. Alfie Minnery, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about this wonderful book that you've just published. This is a book by Delphine Minui, The Book Savers of Daria. Now, thank you for watching Middle East Matters. Don't forget you can follow us on social media. Of course, that's Facebook and Twitter. Do stay tuned.